Thank you, Dan. 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 Thank so let's try to see if we can draw um, what opportunities um, I want to do in terms of stuff. That would be good. Cool. <laughs> um, I think you're listening to the senior vice president of DeepCat, and we are providing a deep management system monthly for the industry, and we have over 100 clients from early North America and also global. John Stills, Chief Innovation Officer for HCM, and I'm really fast at growing commercial success systems globally. Um, I would say one of our core differentiators over the past couple of years is kind of really leading with um, some phase one products and technologies. So that's kind of a core part of our really mission and passion for our culture perception. So, um, so can we even bring technology to provide us some opportunities to improve the ways we do things? So, what opportunities are you guys saying for your company? I think there's two challenges we see when we look at the marketplace with um, investors here. The first one is just access to data, um, which is what John was forward to. Um, and the second is just being more effective in terms of data execution. Um, on the data side, so much of this is built on the memory. Mm-hmm. Um, and from the you know, around the world, we've got some different sources we've been putting in spreadsheets that just need to share it again. I just think it is. I've known for not much spreadsheets and stuff. And on the data execution side, I mean, you know, getting teams together is just complex. It's not only your own people, it's external parties. How do you coordinate that? And then, and quite frankly, if you can't coordinate that, then you have to underwrite and you have to supply the due diligence. And you wind up not being able to think through the risk you need to handle to make decisions, which cuts the business quite a lot for any place you have to stop. I would also say, too, I think um, if you look at kind of the capital markets that we have, like, you know, do it in a commercial way. So in the United States in particular, it's a very unusual situation where the potential buyers are being represented by the seller broker. Mm-hmm. Um, that to me is unusual. Conflict <laughs> 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 of interest, having you know, um, thousands of kind of um, sales pursuits and kind of buying a career, um, it could be kind of like a chip bag. The story of the sales brokers kind of stop and it's like he's benefiting the seller. Mm-hmm. And sometimes if they're not able to cash flow, the buyer is actually going to buy it. And so I think that, um, you know, the, the point that just made is um, information is just kind of the kiosk of the buyer, having kind of given the potential of the buyer is um, access to as much information as what they need to kind of be more comfortable and confident with their decision making on their end. I think those are huge opportunities, particularly in the U.S. Like in years now, the buy side representation is more um, common in the U.S. I think the last time I spent one percent of the U.S. was represented by buy side brokers or advisors. But I think information is becoming a big part of that advisor picture now. So. No, I don't need it. It takes me to the efficiency here. I think it's a big opportunity. Yeah. And to that more into efficiency, because we can talk to you about that. The issue is timeliness and being able to make more effective decisions. And I think we're going to do four together. But then the automated data things that come in make our data make decisions quicker. Obviously, making decisions quick and easy and analytics to understand the data better also contributes to making more visualized decisions. And I think our biggest plan is Blackstone. They know the no big deal. <laughs> they know the big deal. They, they do everything from not just to the dispositions and then basically have you know, their conclusion is they do this quicker and then better you know, because they've got the data. You know, and I would say how, how we come into that in, in terms of our cost and um, kind of alignment of this. But in the deal process, you're giving access to a lot of information which gets guaranteed towards that right selling opportunity. Mm-hmm. But as any investor kind of on the right selling opportunity, the information you have access to beyond that is, is quite high. And then it's kind of like you're starting to have data and then it's you know, real estate that gets data and it's competitive stock data and prospecting data. Whatever it might be, um, that's the way that our kind of cost is really kind of coming is coming to couple together all of those kind of adjacent data sets that make not the acquisition, but almost the actual 
transition mm-hmm. and the most efficient and successful it can be. Mm-hmm. Um, because as soon as you acquire something, you obviously have to put a value in for those things that or you know, the evolution of price points goes. We're trying to think about that and do this stuff together that might make the due diligence process that much more efficient at A1 and so many of them really efficient. And John's point is exactly right. When you get something in, then you want to take it to the life cycle of the asset. And, and so we see a lot of people that take the bank one and they keep it there, they use it to the development process. They use it to, um, you know, and all the other reports on the past that they do for reporting and they have to look at it from a portfolio perspective so they can look at it for their own assets. And then they have to look at it for bank one. And all the other things are the asset. Yeah. But keeping that data there and working it through can kind of it's like multiplying the value of different I would say, Jim, it's it's not uh, what we've seen is it's, it's also the, the rendering of data that creates additional scrutiny for the decision, right? In, in commercial real estate, which is a, a really relationship based business, but kind of almost used to that based decision making. <laughs> yeah, I, I did this. It's just for fun, right? <laughs> I, I did this deal, I had this experience, I had this kind of success point, I had this case study, and it's like we are moving, which I think is. is um, is being obviously pushed by the higher institutional players, but we, you know, push equally to the relationship based business that will come in commercial real estate space. And as that kind of happens, the, the need to have additional layers of certainty kind of more data sets is, is going to be that much more requested. Um, and John, I know you're working with a bunch of different brokers on the team as well as clients. Um, as they make decisions on um, how many investments are um, and location, of course, is especially right now. Location is best in the same person who moves to the same market. Um, what does this location look like right now? And how do you look at that? Yeah, I think it's like more than 90% of the real estate deal. It's just kind of looking in my mind, right? It's driving record time of sales pricing, it's not time of sales pricing, it's the migration of people to the market. Yeah. Um, without that, there wouldn't be kind of record time of sales pricing. So, in any real estate decision, there's a location based data that impacts the quality of that real estate. Mm-hmm. And usually that's something to do with counties of migration or, you know, industry jobs, et cetera. Um, I always approach things from an occupier side. I think most good investors do too, because it's like good investors can get into the, the head of the occupier. Yeah. So many investments can extend to just some. Yeah. And we're sitting with one of the, the top three fund investors globally with the group and we said, our philosophy around how we invest is to get people to the occupier's head because the next thing we know our investment strategy is going to affect them. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it from the occupier's perspective, the occupier needs to wake up each day thinking about how they're going to make the best decision. Yeah. They're thinking about how they need to make a client based decision, a business based decision, a client based decision, a vocational based decision. Real estate is very secondary after all that. Yeah. And so, at least for young men, I'm coming from a product fund, we've really put a ton of focus on what we call the vocational adjacent data. So, aggregating mm-hmm. this aggregating the vocational data sets. Um, there's a high amount of inefficiency, and I know it's kind of yesterday's trying to describe some of that inefficiency, but the amount of data sources that are relevant to vocation is in the hundreds, if not thousands, depending on what kind of country or city. And for an entity um, that's really kind of focused on aggregating that data, a lot of that is going to be for more country institutional occupiers and investors. And on the efficiency of that data perspective, I understand that too. I think a lot of the concentrations of this particular financial market. Now, are you going to focus on where the place to work, where the properties are, and where you are in terms of hurricane risk? And I understand it's ending down, ending crime. I mean, in New York City, I mean, one of the the things that is the framework for that thing is just to sit around, have an office, and then if I have one, then I have places to cover towns and then, yeah. And even then, in, in the market that I'm, I'm from, in, in, the, in the suburbs of that market, it's people of all epistemic data sets. Mm-hmm. And the story of Loudoun County, <laughs> Loudoun County, Virginia, is known to be the data base and um, or the, the data set is from things that occupy tens of millions of square feet the story is not at all about data centers. It's about the fiber underneath them and the mm-hmm. power underneath them and the energy and the you know, overall kind of infrastructure that exists from a public perspective, but when it's the epicenter, then it eventually becomes real estate data story when you start to kind of bring in, okay, where's my available rental market to put my own fiber? But real estate is secondary to 
so we can apply them to infrastructure projects. And then we'll see what we can do. So I think that's what that's about. Um, in terms of your clients and what they used to do with any technology, how would they use it to make decisions on, you know, everything from structuring projects to programming and features? So there's an awful lot of focus, obviously, on the, on the pipeline piece. And um, if you the volume of deals that are often all the deals coming to the that we were talking about, how do you do your place in the and things? And it's interesting, one of our clients starts talking about the sound of knowledge preservation. Mm-hmm. How do you capture your knowledge that you've restored to you? How do you understand what else is happening in the marketplace? And how do you get to get into some of these things? You know, it's, it's done to the fact that you can stuff that you like. You don't need to get into it. You don't need that, but maybe folks on your side, yeah, you don't need to get into it. I think that's one. I think the other thing is, is um, particularly in the development space, just keeping track of the activities in the workflow. Not just about the data, but how to keep track of it. Keep the money, keep track of what needs to be done in the workflow, maybe things like reporting, external collaboration, and stuff. There's just so many places here. You know, there's opportunities for savings here, but you know, for things like that. And, you know, I'd say that, too, that, uh, you know, in, in, in more of a corporate sense, like, right, you've got to come and see if you've done your own process for a clear thing and utilize some of the service to understand it. And then it's the generation of actually capital and that kind of location. The investor side is still quite what are we trying to be done to, to build and kind of prototype um, what kind of model of the product or system is ready. And it's just an investor can approach investment strategy the same way in the sector. Mm-hmm. It would have taken six months now. We've kind of worked with a bunch of investors on a very manual process that can take months. Like how do you kind of pick out the next markets for investment investment sets to actually kind of make some real estate performance with kind of real estate adjacent kind of migration. That all can be kind of automated too. And it's kind of it's, it's fun to kind of see how you can kind of distill a process down to from months to minutes. So we, we're seeing so much data these days. I mean, it's just in the big gap from a lot of them providers. And I don't know if this is, but I think from a lot of conversations I've heard, we're, we're still not where we need to be with real estate data. And John, what roles do we still have in real estate data? So I think that I would say that the challenge we have is that um, I would say a couple of challenges. One is that um, there's a lot of data out there that's completely disaggregated. Mm-hmm. So for entities, um, you know, focused in terms of aggregating uh, various dozens and hundreds of data sets, I think there's a massive opportunity. Um, the benefit of the commercial landscape in this space in terms of efficiency is all of that data is sort of locational based data, right? So you can scale that mm-hmm. uh, so the space, demographics, et cetera, you all point back to the geo point, which there, there can be some efficiency in terms of sort of co-locating the data. Um, into one place. Uh, that said, on the real estate data side, um, I personally feel like the market is way too um, closely tied. Mm-hmm. Um, we believe in real estate that every piece of data is super confidential. And um, you can use that for your example. Google puts out every quarter an immense amount of information on their company and how many people are coming through this company. Somehow in real estate, we believe that we can't put out like we're putting through a separate full analysis based on <laughs> the data. Yeah. We're putting out every other metric feasible to their company, yeah. but we believe that that metric on the second full analysis based on the company they have is completely confidential. Mm-hmm. Same thing with you know, with Brookfield, where they take and you read us on Green or JD Smith, etc. They give us everything we need to know about their portfolio, mm-hmm. but we don't understand what. Amazon and National Union are paying um, five hundred dollars for a piece of lease because we believe that it's confidential, even though it impacts them on a lot of on their portfolio. I think personally, I think that's beginning to change. We've heard from a lot of institutional investors. If you think about the piece of data that's most um, opaque, it's obviously the least financial data. Mm-hmm. And there's been a lot of institutional investor, I would say, support. For beginning to share that information more openly to make trans- more transparent markets. Yeah. And the, the last piece I'll say then is that, again, the, the least opaque part of the market is the pricing from a lease perspective in markets. Commercial real estate is the only 
real estate market where you can't find stuff in this world. You can buy like a thirty million dollar from townhouse town house in London and you have to read the price for the year. If you're looking for you know, that space on the top of a hedge fund and have it on the central park, good luck finding the pricing until you're two weeks in and you're getting changed up again. <laughs> so it's, it's just we, we keep a certain data points hidden because we think it's going to create more leverage mm-hmm. on one side of the equation. I would argue I think it actually takes less leverage. Yeah. The other thing is, I mean, we're impacted by the standards, right? Mm-hmm. You know, seeing the stuff in the industry shrink and, and then the kind of data points can get strength from that. It's just bad for the company because they get the data points off of them. Yeah. But instead of just sticking to the to blank and kind of and, and, and find it seem complete. So it does make it a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, and we've launched all this data. We, we do have a lot of fingertips, but we don't have always. There's a lot to process. There's lots of processes these days, right? Um, and I'm like, how, what, what strategy can you think of that any doctor and any investor um, specifically um, take to process the data better? I mean, I'll, I'll take the first shot there. Data is, data can be scary to many people, right? You have a reference, you don't like spreadsheets, most people don't. Um, data in a spreadsheet is usually not reasonable. <laughs> but how do you bring data to life? And how do you bring it into form your insight, form a strategy, form um, you know, some type of uh, investment you need to make? You need to make data more digestible to human, yeah. and not so scary in terms of thousands and tens of thousands and millions of dollars. Because yeah. um, no, no human being can kind of really digest that. So it's kind of like really, I would say, more based on technology is kind of slightly different. But how do you bring that to life? Mm-hmm. And how do you pick out? Couple of things that might be important for a whole bunch of data. Yeah. Yeah, I think again, I mean, there's so many opportunities here for improvement. Um, I think first of all, just automating the collection, the integration, and the report. I mean, just giving that to them as well. I mean, I think the more the data can be in real time or in real time, you know, and just kind of keep it instantaneous, but that really helps some decisions. The other thing we find is it really is a critical mass decision. I mean, if I take a, a big investor, for example, look at everybody in the world. I met everybody, right? I want to talk to you about a deal, and when you come to me, you want to make this with me. And the deal is going to get up and ask you, right? Yeah. And it, it really creates this, with everybody's on it, it really creates, and, and then, so I just think that's, that's a key point that I know we've seen here. And if you get to the numbers, I think, but the incremental value is a lot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I couldn't agree more. I think it's because sometimes the data is lost. That's the most important data. Yeah. But if everyone's on the same platform, you're not going to have that contributing to the data that has exponential data that's created there. Mm-hmm. It's massive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, part of getting everyone on the same thing is on the same platform. And, you know, I think that we just can explore the technology that I'm right for example. Like we've been saying, you know, something about this investment in real space has been a little bit slower to, to, to jump back, right? Um, um, are you all finding that through, through the work that you're doing that um, investors still need some persuasion on, on your technologies? Is that the case? Um, I'll take that one first. Well, and, 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 and unfortunately, the pandemic actually is, is caused an acceleration because the mm-hmm. need to basically digitize this is the kind of stuff that we need to work with our business. Mm-hmm. Um, we did um, help them with one. Where they found a new product recently, we stopped them and they were kind of like a completely factor. Mm-hmm. They were able to seamlessly actually deal with it. Right? Wow. Because they had everybody on the platform and everybody else was all sitting in the same room. And I mean, I found ones like data here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it really helps. So I say that that would be one. The other thing is, I think there's some momentum here. We can start to see, in our case, hundreds of clients on with us. A lot of clients are looking at this and saying, gee, competitive wise, if they've got better data and they've made better decisions, I'm bidding against them and that's a problem. I'm going to make sure some of the competitive companies. So I think the pandemic, unfortunately, unfortunately has pushed along that thing to just get the charts to actually come up faster and more just competitive wise. I think it's become a lot more fun to work with. And I think there's, even just from kind of hearing these questions from the past couple of days that we've had clients talking about before, um, the multifamily sector is definitely kind of hard right into the church and commercial sector and mm-hmm. just thinking about how can we get some technology that increases the speed of more efficient technology. Um, commercial, as long as you can kind of find a commercial office that's the most transparent, mm-hmm. it's probably going to be the latter in the next two years. Mm-hmm. Because I think the least transparent parts of the market is like the healthcare, lifestyle, um, obviously multifamily, et cetera. We've seen a lot of that in Asia, and I think that's why clients become really attracted to the technology and 
more fun than the main strategy process because the transparency of the office market can be quickly formed and make that something that we're going to use to get to the very top of the most popular most of the time. But again, we were talking before, the institutional investors are going to drive obviously the shift, and what we've seen in the United States too, but almost every institutional investor in the can't actually think about it to have more than that's going to drive them. Um, but they shifted that strategy a lot in the health care and the sort of logistics, mobile tech, etc. And when they become new investors into the remote space, they actually are going to be the kind of first to get more educated on planning and strategic around these sectors. So even your traditional office institutional investment firm is realized, because any one of that family they're going to need is they have to be the people first because they have to get educated before they can form the investment strategy. So, I think it's actually coming to the question quite naturally based on some evidence from the market, but I think the office personally has been substantially better over the last six months. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, we, we talk a lot about institutional investors leading the way in this, um, but then everyone's, uh, you know, going to use uh, PGIM or, you know, I mean, how does that portfolio size vary from the, you know, how does it, you know, how do you use portfolio size in the past the way that companies are going to be able to do it? I think it's it's really run by this a lot of different how many transactions you did. You know, when you think of a company last week and and then you see them coming retail cases and they're going like crazy, but they do a lot of little transactions, right? And and so I think, you know, if you take a look at that, I think it's that's part of the number of transactions you do. And again how how labor intensive is the process of going into infrastructure and development and into these things then a lot of the technology is there just to kind of make it work for them. Mm-hmm. That's the big thing to do. And it's been kind of interesting to, from my perspective, that I'm coming in. So I've been doing the, the data analytics and content technology stuff for, for a long time. And I think you always assume that there's only kind of an institutional fit for the field entities that you would have gone to with. But I've kind of seen a shift in over the past 30, 20, 40, 30 months that it's become more of the super regional operator. And, um, who obviously kind of has regional one or two percent capital in the state, but it's the public face of the ownership. And um, is increasingly interested in coming to that and bigger technology because they can see that they can drive their own peers. And if you think about these firms, they're usually kind of most efficient from a resource use perspective. So they're willing to actually outsource services like analytics services and technology services to others to make them more efficient. So it's always going to be like the two general ownership that extend into five blocks of all things. Mm-hmm. But I think it's that that super regional operator that I look at is really shifting to kind of say, how is becoming the number one most used people in that company? Yeah. Well, and the cloud has helped a lot, right? You don't have to hire them to go in on two steps to put in your own servers and do all this technology and you can get up and then price them all just like ours is a receipt kit and not based on any of them necessarily. So it allows somebody to really get in and learn yeah. quickly yeah. And, 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 and maybe even have another one in, in months, not years. Yeah. 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 Bit of, bit of a question in front of you. Do you think that technology has been still among the larger investors to play on the larger leagues with more institutional firms? 100%. Where are you seeing that, actually? Um, we're in a, a few of our most substantial kind of clients are at a lot of what I would call um, Facebook or super regional perspective. So, again, it's like the one to two percent equity and an offering that the public face of the ownership, but they need to be quicker, more efficient um, than their peers in order to kind of look at that bigger picture. Yeah. This, this is like a technology kind of level point here for sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 that would be really interesting. Um, now, one, one piece that's popular that hasn't been mentioned yet are the brokers. Um, what role does the broker community play in, in, in new technologies? I think here clearly the, the, the integration with the brokers and the you know, management projects like this, there's, there's a big opportunity here. Obviously, we challenge a lot of the acquirers to have us getting all the state owned brokers in different formats and coming in and trying to bring in these, these big ones and acquirers. And it is a challenge, right? And, I think we still try and want to get things that we've done is we have a lot of service that can take you can do the whole thing overnight kind of stuff and in the morning it's sitting on the platform. So we can automate some of that pain that the the, the acquirers have really. Uh, and the, the second thing we're doing and we started is how do you actually have partnership discussions with some of the brokers about taking the data and putting it on the platform. Completely bypassing that whole process and, 
and we think that will happen, you know, to a point where we really get good work on it. Um, and and that will be fantastic. And I find you know, a lot of folks who are going in and doing some research and doing 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 research and